Good evening, brothers and sisters. Praise God. Glad to be with everyone tonight. Uh, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 21, verses 27. Probably won't go all the way to 40. For the sake of time, we'll just probably get to 31. But we're going to really kind of do an old-fashioned Bible study tonight. So I hope everybody has their Bibles and is ready to, to get into the scriptures. So let's start in uh, Acts 21, verse 27. We're kind of picking up where Pedro left, left off in Acts 21 uh, on Sunday. So let's start there. It says, when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law and this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Troph Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. So we'll stop there. Now remember, uh, as Pedro had gone over on Sunday, that when Paul arrived in Jerusalem and he met with James and the elders, he had agreed to follow a Jewish ritual and purify himself along with four other men. So here we start off, Paul is in the temple with these four men waiting for the days of purification to come to an end. And what do you know? The very thing that James and the elders were trying to avoid, right, by appeasing some of the Jews uh, who were not happy with Paul, well, it ended up happening anyway, even though Paul, as Pedro spoke about, compromised his freedom. So I'd like to discuss two things tonight. One, let's talk about what actually happened to Paul here. And two, why did it happen? Because we're going to see that although this is kind of like a brief event, it is going to catapult the rest of the events of the book of Acts. Um, it kind of leads to everything else that happens to Paul later on. So what happens to Paul here? He's attacked by a crowd that was stirred by Jews who came from Asia and falsely accused Paul of a few things. What did they accuse him of? They said he taught everyone everywhere against the people. Well, the people there we know is referring to the Jews. That's who they were. Um, he taught everyone everywhere against the law. He taught everyone everywhere against this place, meaning the temple. And he brought Greeks into the temple. Now, all of these accusations were false. How do we know? Well, look into Acts 24, verses 10 through 13. This is later on when Paul's on trial and he's testifying before Felix and he's kind of going over the events that had happened that day. And he says to him, uh, when Paul replied, knowing that for many years you have been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. Neither can they prove to you what they now bring up against me. Also later when he testifies before Festus of these same events in Acts 25, 7, he, it says, when he had arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, bringing many and serious charges against him that they could not prove. So here we know by these, uh, what Paul testifies that these events, these accusations were false. They did not occur. So let's go into them. Now, did he really teach everyone everywhere? Now, this is a twisting of, of, right? The Jews are kind of twisting things around, right? Because in Acts 19.10, you know, these Jews from Asia, what did they know? Well, it says there, they continued for two years so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So while they're accusing Paul of doing these things everywhere to everyone, really, in Asia, yes, it was, it says, to everyone, everywhere. 
but not everyone everywhere all over, right? So Paul was accused of speaking against the Jews. Did he really speak against the Jews? Well, let's see what he did say. Well, in Romans 10.1, Paul actually says that he wished they all would be saved. So that's not against the Jews, right? He said that his heart's desire and prayer for, for God is that they may be saved. Right, now, what did he say that they may, again, twist to say it's against him? Well, in Acts 13, 46, basically, Paul says that he's turning to the Gentiles because of their hard hearts, right? Uh, it says, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we're turning to the Gentiles. And he didn't even say this to all the Jews, right? Just to the ones who rejected his message. In Acts 14, 1, it says, Now at Iconium, they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. So there you had Jews who did believe. So clearly, Paul didn't have a problem with them, right? What else did he say about to the Jews or about the Jews? Well, he said that being Jewish didn't make them right with God. Right, in Romans 2, verse 17, and then verse 23 through 24, what did he say? But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God, then when he says, you who boast in the Lord dishonor God by breaking the law. As it is written, the name of, is, of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So Paul basically said, because they really weren't following the law, that they made God look bad, right, to others. So, of course, they didn't like that. But he was speaking against those who were doing that, not against the Jews in general. And uh, so let's move on down to the law, right? Because it says that Paul spoke out against the law. So what did Paul actually say about the law? Well, in Romans 7, 12, he said the law is holy, the commandment is holy and righteous and good. So clearly, Paul did not speak against the law. What did he say that they tried to twist? Well, in Galatians 2.16, he says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. He also said that the Jews didn't understand what the purpose of the law was, that it was just a temporary placeholder or guardian until the Messiah Jesus Christ came. Now he says this in Galatians 3, 23 through 25. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. What else did he say about the law? Well, he said that the law of Moses couldn't give you freedom, only Jesus could do that. In Acts 13, verse 32 through 33 and verse 39, he said, and we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And verse 39, he goes on to say, and by everyone who believes, is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. So clearly what he was saying is that the law of Moses, again, couldn't justify you, couldn't forgive you of sin, but Jesus could. He also spoke in Acts 15 verses 1 through 2, he argued that circumcision wasn't necessary for salvation. Right? He says, but some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. So they debated this, right? That circumcision wasn't necessary. So again, Paul didn't say things against the law. He just spoke about what the law was for, what the law did, and what it didn't do. Regarding the temple, did Paul say anything about the temple? I think they just threw that in there. Because all you could find that Paul ever said about any temple was in Acts 17 where he's speaking to Gentiles, really, and he tells them that God doesn't live in temples that are made by man. So he didn't say anything against the temple. Now, the last charge that was brought against him was that he brought Greeks into the temple. 
Now Luke documents that this was an assumption, right? Since the Jews, the Asian Jews, I remember they were Asian Jews, they saw Paul with Trophimus, who was also from Asia, in the city. So when they saw Paul in the temple, they just assumed, well, he must have brought Trophimus with him. But that was a dangerous charge because to bring a Gentile into the temple, it's against the Mosaic law and it would defile the temple. Now that happened to be at that time also against Roman law and was punishable by death, which is why they attacked Paul, right, and, and got riled up to, to seize, to lay hands on him and to bring him before the Romans to kill him because that was also against Roman law. Now think about it. They brought these false accusations against Paul. Why? They had to twist his words because they couldn't refute his doctrine. Think about it, brothers and sisters. Have you ever shared the gospel with somebody? And they know they can't really argue with you against the word of God. So they start making personal attacks against you or trying to say that you said something to them that was offensive. But they never actually really refute what you're saying. And this is the case that happened with Paul. His words were never refuted. They just wanted to silence him. So now I want to move on and talk about the second thing I said we'll talk about tonight, which is why was this happening to Paul? I want to really get into this. I mean, why did all this happen? I mean, didn't he submit to the suggestion by James and the elders? I mean, wasn't that supposed to avoid him getting into this kind of trouble? But the truth is the fact that he did submit to this request, it leads into why he went through this particular persecution. Now, first of all, Paul submitted to it. Why? Because as Pedro went over, it was a compromise of his freedom, but not his faith, right? Meaning it wasn't a matter of salvation, right? He wasn't told, well, you need to do this in order to be saved. Or he wasn't forced or coerced, right? He wasn't asked to do it in order to be pleasing to God or to be a good Christian. Also, you can look at it and say, well, the reason they asked him to do it was true. They weren't asking him to lie, right? Look back in verse 21 of this chapter. Did Paul teach the Jews to forsake Moses? Did he teach them not to circumcise their children or not to walk according to the customs? No, Paul didn't teach those things. What he taught was that they couldn't justify you and they could not save you. That's what Paul taught. Remember Acts 15, those brothers that came down were teaching the people to follow the customs so they could be saved. Now, that was wrong. Paul basically said, look, you can follow these customs if you want, but they cannot save you or justify you. All right. So in verse 24, again, remember, they also said to Paul, hey, this will show them that you live in observance of the law. So did Paul live in observance of the law or not? Well, we'll say this. He did if it meant opening a door to the gospel message, but he did not do it for his conscience or again, in order to be saved. In 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 20, what does it say? For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law that I might win those under the law. So yes, there were many times Paul did live in observance of the law. Why? To win those under the law. And there are many examples of this. I'm sure many times when he went to the synagogues and he was asked to speak, he didn't go in there outwardly disagreeing and changing their customs and not following along with whatever type of custom they had when they were in the synagogues. He, he did it, right? He had no problem with it. And then he spoke when he had an opportunity. Even the example of having Timothy circumcised. So that shows he was not against circumcision, but he didn't do it for salvation. And he didn't teach others that they had to do it. Now, why also did Paul submit to this? Well, the reality is Paul knew that it wasn't going to change the outcome of what was going to happen to him as prophesied. So he was kind of like, you know what, James, elders, this helps to kind of appease your conscience and help you to deal with, kind of, with what's the trouble that I've been going through. Because I'm sure they felt for Paul with all the trouble you have been going through. Fine, I'll do it. But remember what Paul said in Acts 20, verse 22, which is before all this happened. He says there, and now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there 
except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Now, isn't it very interesting that the advice given to Paul by James and the elders, which he follows, is the very action that leads to the fulfillment of this scripture. What else was told to Paul? In Acts 9, remember when Paul was first converted on the road to Damascus in verse 15 through 16, what did Jesus say to him? He says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Now, this part of this that hadn't happened yet. Paul brought the message, right, to the Gentiles. He brought the message to the children of Israel, the Jews. But who hadn't he brought this message to? Who hadn't he carried Jesus' name to? Two kings. So what we'll see is that this incident in the temple is actually kind of a catalyst for Paul to eventually come before a king. Because what happens? Well, going forward, in order to avoid being given over to the Jews, we're trying to kill him, Paul has to keep appealing his case. It's kind of like when you go to court and your case is denied and you go to a high court and a high court and eventually you make it to the Supreme Court. Well, that's what happens to Paul if you keep reading the rest of the book of Acts. First, he takes his case, right? Well, he speaks to the Jewish council, which is the Sanhedrin. Then he takes his case before Felix the governor. Felix the governor. Then his case goes before Festus. So all the while, he's sharing his story. He's sharing about Jesus. He's sharing the gospel before these men in power. And finally, he comes before King Agrippa, the last Jewish king of Judea. And he has the opportunity to share the word of God and preach the gospel to this king. And this basically, what we're talking about, takes the next four years of Paul's life almost to the end of the book of Acts. So this little stretch here we're reading in these verses of 27 through 40 actually uh, kind of is really what takes Paul to fulfill the work that Jesus had given him to do, what he had been appointed to do right from the beginning when he was saved in Acts chapter 9. And basically, that is the end of my lesson for you guys tonight. I hope you can enjoy your um, time inside your discussions and answering the questions. God bless. Mm -hmm.